special presenter, Dr. Jakob Falkov, uh, whom I will introduce in a minute. I also just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the program for this season. Well, first of all, the seminar is in its eighth year of functioning, and uh, we are in the eighth month of uh, the war in Ukraine. And of course, uh, I wanted to have some events that uh, show connections to um, the tragedy that we're all living through. And in that sense, both today's event, which has to do with gathering information about atrocities that are committed in uh, occupied territories. And the second event of this semester, which will be on November 30th, this will be a talk by Professor Victoria Hitterer of Millersville, which will deal with the commemoration and memorialization of the Shoah in Kiev. Uh, both, I think, have uh, a lot of relevance to the war and that the events that we all follow with trepidation. And uh, also, I want to tell you uh, about um, our sponsors, uh, the Harvard uh, uh, Center for Jewish Studies, uh, whom I thank uh, profusely, and of course, uh, uh, the Davis Center, and I specifically want to thank Laura Sargent for all the logistical support. And now it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome Dr. Yakov Palkov, who is a Latvia-born Israeli historian. In 2013, he received his PhD in military and intelligence history from Tel Aviv University, while researching the intelligence activities of Soviet partisans during World War II. He was a visiting scholar at Oxford University, then at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and at the World Holocaust Remembrance Center and Archive Yad Vashem. Dr. Falkov is the author of uh, a number of books and many, many uh, publications. I will um, just mention his book, Forest Spies, the Intelligence Activity of the Soviet Partisans, 1941 to 1945, which was published in Hebrew by Yad Vashem and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in, two, in 2017. And it was awarded the Historical Society of Israel Prize for 2021, which is a very prestigious prize. And also uh, Falkov's book, Between Hitler and Churchill, two Jewish agents and the effort made by British intelligence to prevent secret Polish Nazi collusion, which was published in Hebrew in 2022. And if I could spill the beans just a little bit, an English translation is, uh, um, I hope soon, going to be published in the series that I edit uh, with Academic Studies Press on Jews of uh, Russia and Eastern Europe and their legacy. Dr. Falkov is also co-author of the book, Fighters Across Frontiers, Transnational Resistance in Europe, 1936-1948, which was published in England by Manchester University Press and numerous other publications in English, Hebrew, and Russian. Dr. Falkov teaches at Tel Aviv University and Reichman University in Israel. Yaakov, I'm delighted to welcome you. Thank you so much for finding time in your busy schedule. I know you've been traveling. You were just in Denmark, then in Poland, but I think now you're back uh, in Israel, back at home. And uh, the title of Dr. Falkov's presentation is The Holocaust Through the Eyes of Soviet Intelligence, 1939 to 1945. Please, uh, Yaakov, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I'm I, very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. And uh, thank you especially uh, to Professor Schreiman for, uh, excuse me, for uh, having me here today and to the organizers of this uh, wonderful event. And actually, I will start with uh, sharing my presentation in uh, just a second. Yeah, it goes like here. Yeah, the Holocaust through the eyes of the Soviet intelligence, 1939, 1945. Uh, and let's proceed. Yeah, we can skip now the title. Yeah, so 
I will start from this very interesting point. Actually, as you can see here, in early July 1939, uh, which is about two months before the invasion of Poland, the Nazi invasion of Poland, uh, Vice People's Commissar for Defense and the head of the Red Army Political Department, a guy called Lev Mechlis, a Jew by himself, by the way, he uh, actually uh, received this very interesting paper, very interesting uh, report written or submitted by the military intelligence of the Soviet Union called Razvedvatelna uh, Upravlenia, RU. And it spoke, the document spoke about the plans of the German invaders, their preparations for the invasion of Poland. So the Soviets, first of all, they knew for sure that Germans are are going to strike uh, the Polish territory. But here actually underlined by, uh, in red, you can see it here in the right uh, corner was also included the sentence which spoke about specifically about the uh, Jewish quarter of Warsaw. And according to the source to the uh, RU, the Russian military intelligence source, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the German representatives in uh, the German embassy in Warsaw told the source that half of the German bombardment blessing, Blagoslavenia bomb, and so in the Russian translation, will fall on the Jewish quarter. It is amazing. It is my revelation in, my, in one of the... Uh, a Soviet intelligence reports that I have seen until today. And actually it shows us that already before the invasion of Poland, the Soviets started to understand that the Germans, the Nazis, they are not going just to invade Polish territory, yeah? But they are targeting specifically, they are targeting the local Jewish population in order to destroy entire Jewish quarters like this one in Warsaw. This is a very important revelation uh, and we will proceed actually to the entire presentation. I will talk briefly about the birth of this research I will dedicate a bit time uh, uh, to the sources of this research and the, uh, later to the key findings and we will come to the conclusions and a few words about my future research. So let's start. Actually, this journey to the understanding of the knowledge of the, intelli of the intelligence, Soviet intelligence knowledge about the Holocaust started already about 15 years ago when I was working on my PhD project. Uh, and later on, it was translated into a book shown here. And I also have it here yeah, in my hands. Actually, as a Professor Schreier already told, it was published a few years ago uh, um, by the Yad Vashem and the a Jewish uh, excuse me, the uh, Jerusalem Hebrew University. It was their co-production. And it spoke about the intelligence activity of the Soviet partisans in the German occupied territories. Unfortunately, uh, as Professor Schreier also told, it has not been published yet to other languages, but there is a very nice review written about this book by uh, my colleague, Dr. Samuel Bernay from the Hebrew University, and it was published in Oxford uh, last year. So uh, you are invited to go and uh, read this uh, nice review, this nice article. But specifically what I uh, would like to stress is the fact that one of the chapters of this book speaks about the knowledge of the partisan intelligence about the Holocaust in the Nazi occupied territories in the Soviet Union. And what I revealed among other things while working on this project was the fact that the Soviets 
were very much interested in everything connected to the behavior of the German occupiers behind the front line. Every and each pattern of their behavior was of very big interest for the Soviets, for the Soviet intelligence and uh, for the partisan intelligence. And they dedicated also the Soviet partisans, the intelligence men, they dedicated much attention to the subject of the Holocaust. And why so? So I found in different Soviet intelligence publications starting from the early 20s that actually, actually they were trying to learn as much as possible about the adversary, about the potential adversary and real adversary. And they believed the Soviet, Soviet intelligence theorists, they demanded to gather as much information as possible to as possible as possible to study the adversary in its entirety. It is very important. So in our case, in our case, they quite quickly understood the uh, partisans and their intelligence men. They quite quickly understood that actually the Holocaust, the mass annihilation of the Jewish population, presents one of the most important pattern, patterns of, uh, of the occupation of the Soviet Western territories. So they tried to learn as much as possible to gather every possible information, piece of information to report to their superiors in Moscow and other places about this very, very unique, even in their eyes, very unique uh, phenomenon. So as I have learned during this research about the partisan intelligence, uh, they, they covered the entire period of killings and almost the entire occupation territory from the beginning, from the uh, very invasion until the very last stages of the occupation in the Soviet territory and from the north from the Leningrad region, for example, in Karelia, Karelia, uh, 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 until uh, uh, Northern uh, Caucasus. And they knew almost, um, or discovered almost uh, all the genocidal events, almost all the key events of a uh, killing of, an, uh, of a, a peaceful Jewish population. And of course, they were trying to inform the rulers, uh, even in the Kremlin, constantly about their findings. It was a very, very nice, very important revelation, uh, very much appreciated as I told by Yad Vashem, for example. But at the end of the process, it was quite clear to me that um, borrowing uh, the astronomy uh, terminology, I would like to say it was like a kind of moon near a much bigger planet, which must be the knowledge of the entire intelligence, Soviet intelligence community about the Holocaust in the Nazi occupied territory. So by now we had this specific knowledge about the intelligence of the partisan movement, which was very nice. And I decided to proceed to a much bigger challenge, which is the knowledge of the entire intelligence Soviet community about the Holocaust. Uh, firstly, of course, in the Soviet territories occupied by the Nazis, but possibly also in other territories. So the research sub questions are by now, when at all and what the Russian intelligence services knew about the attitude, the general attitude of the Nazi regime to uh, firstly to the German Jewish population, and afterwards to the European, European Jewish population, of course, to the Jews of the Soviet Union. And what exactly they knew about the fate of European Jews prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. During this period, as I said, between, between uh, the summer of 1939 and summer of 1941, and afterwards, uh, um, a, a very important question is the development of their interest and knowledge of the Holocaust after the invasion of the Soviet Union, the characteristics, the patterns of the reporting about the Holocaust, the scope, the time, uh, uh, 
timeline, the geography, the accuracy, the language, the emotions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all these are of special interest for us. And of course, the question of the consumers. Who knew exactly? Did Stalin know, for example, about the Holocaust, about the uh, in its entirety, about all the events, about the numbers, for example, in real time? Okay, this is a very important question for us since it uh, enables the understanding of their policy. When we know, and I will mention uh, this also later, they, they know that they uh, did publish almost nothing about the Holocaust uh, in real time. Uh, they um, they uh, were very, very unwilling uh, to, 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 to publish, to disclose much information to tell their own people and the entire world about the Holocaust. And the big question is whether they did it based on solid knowledge about those events or probably they knew something, but not much, okay? So it is very important to understand the scope of the knowledge about those tragic events uh, regarding the uh, Soviet Jewish uh, population. Uh, speaking about speaking about the sources, which is a very important topic, since we are talking about the intelligence knowledge, uh, much of the information related to this phenomenon is state key, is, is is still very uh, 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 keep very close uh, guarded very well by the uh, currently Russian intelligence community and their archives. Most of them, or all of them, uh, especially today during the war with, uh, with uh, Ukraine, uh, they, these archives are still closed, unfortunately. But there are, first of all, different official publications by different Russian intelligence services, by the security service FSB, and later on, uh, also by the GRU. Uh, by the successor of the, the uh, RU, uh, which I already mentioned, and the uh, memories of different veterans who uh, wrote quite a lot, amazingly, but uh, these, the, the veterans of this intelligence, the Soviet intelligence community, who participated in different events during World War II, they wrote and published quite a, lo uh, uh, quite a lot. And of course, there are also multiple former Soviet archives in different former Soviet republics. And I went through, I think, almost all of them or all of them across the former Soviet republics, starting with the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And also, I was lucky enough to get to Ukraine to visit the local archives before the war in Kiev, especially and to see many, uh, many publications of the of, uh, uh, NKVD, uh, which was uh, the uh, state security and intelligence service during Stalin's times. And of course, in Belarusia, in Minsk, the state archive, and also different archives in, archives in other countries. And uh, Professor Schreier already mentioned the USHMM, and they have a, a unique, an amazing collection of the former Soviet documents, including the intelligence documents, which they uh, managed to obtain uh, about 30 years ago from uh, different Soviet archives, including even the intelligence archives. So they do possess this very, very unique collection of documents. And of course, also here in Israel, in Yad Vashem, we have very nice collections uh, they are not all, all always similar. These those collections in the USA, in the USA, and, and in Yad Vashem. So it was very interesting to see all of them and to compare also. And uh, of course, uh, I went uh, through different European archives, uh, especially in the, in England, the Q archives. They also have very nice collections of documents related to the uh, discussed period of time, related to the Soviet intelligence services, et cetera, et cetera. So we are now based on a very solid ground of, I would say, thousands of documents related to the period, to, to the period of interest and related to the Soviet intelligence community. And also, of course, 
fo focusing on their reporting of uh, on the on the Holocaust in the German occupied territories of the Soviet Union. And here, in fact, we are approaching facts. We are approaching our story. And again, I will take us back even a bit earlier to the invasion of the Soviet Union. Actually, we will start from the very beginning of the Nazi regime in Germany. In the first month of its existence, already as you can see here, in June 1933, just a few months after the Nazis coming to the power in Germany, the Soviet, the uh, same, the same military intelligence, Soviet military intelligence, reported by this time to Vice People's Commissar for Defense, Tavarish Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky, who was a very prominent figure in the Soviet hierarchy of uh, military hierarchy and very powerful figure by this time, they reported him about the, a, 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 a cable telegram sent by this guy called Frederick Sackett, who was the US ambassador to Germany by this time. They managed to seal his report sent by him from Berlin to the US, to Washington. Uh, we do not know how exactly they did this, but they did this and they translated it into Russian and they provided Tukhachevsky with the exact translation of this cable. And actually he spoke here about the growing anti-Semitism in Germany. As you can see here, a sinister anti-Semitic character and they are trying, the Germans, many Germans, they are trying to take revenge on the alleged uh, culprits of their misfortune on the Jews. Okay, so here from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the Soviet rulers are starting to see such reports, are starting to understand that the Germans are behaving towards the Jewish population differently. And actually they are applying a very harsh measures against this specific population. They are targeting specifically Jews, first of all, uh, excuse me, uh, first of all, in Germany. Uh, uh, we are uh, going further and here we are witnessing another report, no less important, which was again, again, stolen by the Soviet intelligence by this time by the NKVD. So actually, as I already stressed, we are talking about two big services. The first one is the military intelligence, the RU, and the second one, now we are talking about the NKVD, which was the uh, security and intelligence service, by, but civil one, okay? So they actually managed to steal this report written by this time by Sir Horace Rumble, who was the UK ambassador to Germany. And he met his colleague, the local minister of foreign affairs, Konstantin von Neurath, and they discussed uh, different matters, actual matters, and among other things, they also, uh, uh, Rumble also touched upon the, uh, uh, the question of the attitude of the Germans, of the new regime, German, uh, German new regime to, towards the Jewish population. And in fact, he wrote to his superiors in London, in fact, for Neurath admitted that the Jews are being persecuted without distinction, all of the Jewish population, not only the Jews uh, who came from Eastern Europe after the uh, First World War, but also uh, the entire Jewish population of the Reich, they were persecuted because of being Jews, okay? And again, this specific report was stolen and translated uh, meticulously by the NKVD and presented to their superiors in Moscow. Uh, and so again, from the very beginning, from the first month of the uh, uh, existence of this Nazi regime in Germany, the Soviet rulers are starting to understand that the Nazis are persecuting, especially the Jews in their country. 
We will speak this uh, skip, excuse me, uh, further to Austria during the Anschluss times, uh, 1938. Okay, actually, and almost immediately, a few days after uh, uh, this event, a source within the Gestapo, a named source, told his Soviet handlers, his NKVD handlers, that first and foremost, a series of harsh measures will be taken against the Jews. Again, we are talking about a very precise information. And since we know now that the only, the only source within the Gestapo headquarters in Berlin by this time was really Lehmann, it is, more, it is most likely that he was the source who provided his handlers, his Soviet handlers with this information. But again, this information was uh, disseminated among different bodies, among different consumers in the Soviet Union. So again, they knew that five years after the takeover uh, of taking uh, uh, the power in Germany, okay, the Nazis now are ruling this big territory, not only the German territory, but by now also the Austrian territory, and they are doing the same. They are persecuting the Jewish population across this big country. And we already saw this amazing report sent by a source within the German embassy in Warsaw just a few months prior to the invasion of the Polish territory in September 1939. And after the partition of Poland in October 1939, the Soviet intelligence, you may see here on this map, they were trying to establish different outposts, okay, along the new border with the Germans. They started to call it the Soviet-German border. So for them, the Polish independent state ceased to exist. And by now they were trying to gather as much information as possible about the situation in the German occupied Polish territories. And again, the logic was, as we, we already saw, to know as much as possible about the potential adversary. They knew that there will be a day that uh, when they will meet the Germans on the battleground. Okay, so they were trying to understand them uh, 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 very well. So here they are sending dispatching their different sources, different agents into the Polish territory, into the Nazi occupied Polish territory. And these guys are learning about the situation in these territories and they are starting to report about the situation, about again, the persecution of the local Jewish population. By now, not only uh, just persecution, but also actually the starting of the mass killing of the uh, local Jewish men, for example, okay? And they even managed to establish, as far as we know, and we, unfortunately, we do not know a lot about it today, but as far as we uh, learn, uh, they managed to establish their outpost, the NKVD outpost, or in Russian, Residentura, even within the Warsaw Jewish ghetto which is very important. And it was confirmed just a few days ago by my Polish colleagues. I had in Denmark uh, a very good conversation with them and they confirmed, yes, there are different signs of the existence of such residentura, of such a, a outpost of the NKVD within the Warsaw ghetto. And I will try to obtain as much information as possible about this very interesting phenomenon. But we know that they were sending these different sources within the Polish occupied territory, they were sending a lot of information about the fate of the Jewish population and specifically about the Warsaw Ghetto. They knew uh, about uh, the number of its inhabitants in the ghetto. They knew for sure and informed their superiors about 
the high mortal uh, rate of mortality about among, among the Jewish population of the ghetto, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they they gave their superiors, the consumers, quite a precise picture about the real condition of the Jewish population in the Nazi occupied part of Poland, which is amazing. And here we are approaching even more amazing uh, page of this story. I would say, uh, as you can see here, these amazing faces, I found them and it is also my small revelation, but this research, it is full of different amazing revelations. So one of them is these guys, these men and women, mostly, by the way, mostly young men who were trying to escape the persecution by the Germans, by the Nazis from the Polish territory to the Soviet territory, to the Polish, to the, to the, uh, after the partition, yeah, there was also the, the Polish territory, Eastern territories, so-called so -called Kresiv Schodny, occupied by the Soviets. So they were trying to escape from the Germans to the Soviets. And why mostly young men, since as I already said, during the initial period of the occupation in Poland, during the first months, uh, the Germans were targeting specifically young men. So these were trying to escape massively to the Soviet territory. And many of them were compelled, forced to cross the border without the official permission. Actually, thousands of them did this. And Many of them, many thousands, were caught, arrested by the same NKVD on the border. And later on, they were interrogated mostly in Lviv, Lviv uh, and then sent to the prisons to different camps for uh, between three to five years. But during their interrogations, and it is amazing, yeah, they gave many of them hundreds, thousands of them gave a very nice description of the situation in Poland, including the persecution of the Jewish population. So here for the first time, actually, from this unique NKVD source, we have the, a, a very interesting information about the entire process of crossing the border, where, who, how, et cetera, et cetera. We do know about the patterns, do learn about the patterns of uh, the Nazi persecution of the Jewish population. Uh, we do learn about different Nazi facilities in Poland used for detaining and killing of local Jews. And of course, we have numbers, numbers of people caught by the Germans, killed by the Germans, persecuted by the Germans. It is, as I said, a unique picture and I'm going to write a chapter for the book, which will be published by um, uh, Barilan University in Israel a and Rutledge uh, next year in London. So I will dedicate a chapter to this specific, completely unknown uh, phenomenon. And here we are talking about the invasion of the Soviet Union, 22nd of June, 1941. It is a very well-known fact. And actually when the Germans are entering this territory. They are meeting there up to 3 million Jews, which is a huge number. Just think about it. Up to three, as you can see here, up to 3 million Jews who didn't manage to escape these territories to the more inner uh, lands of the Soviet Union. And only up to 5% of these huge, na huge number managed to survive uh, the German, the Nazi occupation. All the rest perished. And most of them were killed during the first, the initial months of the occupation. There was a big wave of atrocities against this uh, Jewish uh, population. And the Nazis saw it particular, as I uh, wrote here, particular urgency in rapidly exterminating the local Jews whom they regarded as the mainstay, the backbone of the entire Bolshevik regime. So the Germans are doing this and the Soviet intelligence, not only the partisans, but, but the entire intelligence community, it is 
facing facing this unique phenomenon and when we are talking about the community it is very important to stress the fact that there were many different body, bodies which gathered this specific information i have already mentioned here in the middle the central staff of the partisan movement it established in may 1942 okay but uh, already prior to its establishment since the very beginning of the occupation the initial partisan uh, detachments and the different uh, forces started to report to moscow about the attitude of the nazis to the uh, local jewish population but also we are talking about the different communist undergrounds across the entire occupied territory all of them were gathering information about the adversary about its behavior in the occupied territories and they were sending this information to moscow and to other places kiev etc etc and we are also talking of course as i already already mentioned the nkvd and it established a special fourth directorate for for conducting different operations intelligence and sabotage operations in the german rear and these guys, they were also gathering information about the Holocaust. And of course, two different, two, two, two main bodies of the central military staff, Soviet military staff, the Red Army staff. Firstly, the intelligence, already mentioned intelligence directorate, the RU, but also the chief political directorate under Mechlis, also already mentioned guy. And all of them were competing each other in gathering information in the Nazi occupied territories. And all of them were obtaining different pieces of testimonies about the extermination of the Jewish population. Uh, it is very interesting to learn about the sources. So we naturally are talking about the agents reports there were many thousands of agents uh, handled by different uh, services, different intelligence bodies, which I already mentioned, but also they were questioning different partisan and uh, intelligence detachments groups. They were questioning the local population uh, where it was possible about uh, the behavior of the Germans, about the whereabouts of different German units, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And, and they were getting the information about the extermination of the Jews. Of course, the interrogations of prisoners of war and deserters played a very, very important role in obtaining this information. Here in, in this picture, we can see a, one of such interrogations to NKVD people within a partisan detachment. They are interrogating a Jew, uh, excuse me, German, a Nazi prisoner of war. And the second point is the Holocaust survivors' testimonies. Those uh, Jews, men and women few of them uh, were uh, lucky enough to escape different killing sites and join different partisan and intelligence groups in the german rear and they were providing different pieces of information different testimonies about their own fate and the fate of their relatives and friends and this information was picked up uh, picked up by the by, by, by the uh, uh, partisan intelligence by the NKVD and RU units, and sent again to Moscow, and compiled together in a much bigger picture about the Holocaust and of course the enemy radio communications interception. Not so much the German, but for example the communication of the Roman authorities of the Roman uh, military who occupied Odessa and other territories uh, in South Ukraine, these communications were intercepted by the RU, by the military intelligence. And among other things, the Soviets learned about the attitude of the Germans and the uh, uh, Romanian uh, authorities towards the uh, local Jewish population. And speaking about the concrete cases, about the specific knowledge of the Holocaust. Uh, uh, we will survive a few of them here. 
And for example, as you can see here from the very beginning, this guy called Pantelimon Panamarenko, who was the communist party head in Belarus and later on also the chief partisan, the head of the partisan movement, he started already in June, late June and later on in July and in August to write to Moscow and personally to Stalin about the unprecedented extermination of the local Jewish population in Belarus. And here in August, September, October 1941, we do see multiple reports by the NKVD about the extermination process. They are studying the patterns of this process and they are informing all these guys. Firstly, the Pavel Fitin, the head of the intelligence apparatus in Moscow in, at Lubyanka, uh, Lavrenti Beria, the head of the NKVD, Alexander Sherbakov, the head of the Soviet Information Bureau and uh, the head of the Red Army Political Department. All of them are constantly informed about the attitude uh, of the Germans toward the Jewish population, about the mass persecution. We are talking also about their ability to learn the exact numbers of the Jewish victims. Like in this case, again, please put your attention, quite early in September 1941, in the city of Pinsk, they know for sure that the Germans are already exterminated, they have exterminated 10,000 of the local Jews. And this specific number was later completely corroborated by the current uh, uh, study of the Holocaust in this specific territory. Uh, the key events like this in Babi Yar, quite early they are learning about them and they are learning quite precisely about the number of victims. They are giving here 40,000 uh, uh, victims, uh, men and uh, uh, women, and children who were killed by the Germans. Now we know that the number was about 30, 33, 44,000. But again, taking into consideration the very complicated, very harsh conditions in the field, the very ability to achieve this number, to learn this number and to report it quickly to Moscow is amazing. It's really, really amazing. So we are talking here about a very, very nice accomplishment of the Soviet intelligence or the NKVD. Again, speaking about the geography, uh, I can tell now that not only the partisans, but also other intelligence bodies they were widely spread across many, many different occupied territories and they were reported about the behavior of the Germans from the north down to the south in Northern Caucasus. And they also were reporting about the mass killing of the Jewish population. Like here in this example above, you can see here near Moscow, in late 1941, they were talking about the burning of the local group of the local Jews and in many other places. So again, we can establish by now that the entire or almost entire occupied territory was covered by uh, uh, the intelligence reporting and uh, the information about the fate of the Jewish population was coming from different places to Moscow and again compiled and reported to the superiors in uh, the Kremlin. Speaking about the reporting, uh, from the beginning, they were actually including, they were melting the information about the fate of the Jews within the general reports about the situation in the, uh, in the occupied territories. But later on, after having understood that the fate of the Jews in those territories is something different, that the Jews are suffering mostly from the occupation, okay? They started to separate this topic in separate, separate chapters titled like here, you can see it here, anti yevreyski terror anti-Jewish anti terror, and they were actually stressing the very fact that the Jews are suffering a lot. Again, not all, 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 all of the, the peoples, 
in the occupied territories, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Russians, and others were suffering. They were suffering terribly. But again, even, even the intelligence guys, the Soviet intelligence guys, understood quite quickly that the Jews were suffering much more than others. And they were trying to stress this very fact, this understanding, but by putting it under, un, under th these titles, by separating it, this uh, information in different chapters. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. It was too early. Okay. How? Ah, yes, here. So, uh, one more, um, one more uh, uh, topic, actually understanding of the genocidal character of the Ger German anti-Jewish atrocities in the USSR. As you can see here, the national question, the topic titled national question, the national uh, question, and it was this guy called um, Iman Sudmalis, the Komsomol leader in Latvia, firstly Sovietized and then occupied by the Germans. He spent about half a year in the occupied territories and uh, came back to the Soviet territory. And he wrote a very nice, very detailed report about the situation in uh, the occupied Latvian territory, occupied by the Germans, of course, yeah. And he stressed that in Latvia, like elsewhere, okay, uh, 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 the Jews, the Jews are overtly exterminated as a people. So he wrote here, you can see it here, ich akravenna unichtajayut kak narod, as a people. He didn't use the word genocide since it was invented much later, but he knew that the Nazis are killing the Jews until the last of them. And he was trying to report this to his superiors and to the Kremlin. And later on, we are also witnessing different such wordings uh, in, diff in, diff in many different other intelligence reports. Unichtajayut, the Polnist, you are, in, are entirely exterminated, massively physical exterminia, the mass physical extermination, et cetera, et cetera. So they knew those guys who wrote those reports, they knew for sure that the Jews are suffering mostly and they are being exterminated until the last of them. And we are approaching the end of this uh, presentation, but it is very important to stress that even after the liberation of the Soviet territory from the German presence, the Soviets kept gathering information about different multiple killing sites in Eastern Europe established by the Nazis and especially in the Polish territory. In here, one more revelation, which is amazing. We are witnessing a report sent by a group of NKVD of the already mentioned fourth directorate these guys, as I said, were operating behind the front line and gathering information for uh, uh, the purposes of the NKVD, for the purposes of the, the Red Army. And they here they reported about the uh, uh, Auschwitz camp. And they reported about the mass killing of the uh, inmates of the camp, specifically the Jews. And as you can see here, the head of the fourth department Tavarish uh, Pavel uh, Sudoplatov, he wrote by his hand on this report, Gdelu Lagere Auschwitz, to store in the file of the Auschwitz camp. So we can learn from this that at this stage, already in uh, the summer of 1944, approximately half a year before uh, a, uh, the liberation of this camp by the Red Army in January 1945, this place was already well known to the Soviets and there was even a separate file in the NKVD archive dedicated to this camp. And later on also we are uh, a witnessing more uh, similar reports provided by other different services in this case, about Treblinka, for example, also after the liberation of this place, they were gathering as much uh, testimonies and they were 
committing their investigation in the place and again writing a very detailed reports to their superiors. And we are approaching the question of uh, the consumers, as I saw in the case, very clearly in the case of the partisan movement, partisan intelligence, here too, we actually are capable of establishing, of claiming that uh, actually all these nice, very detailed information about the fate of the Soviet Jews under the Nazi occupation was circulated, disseminated uh, uh, among all the, all the Soviet rulers. Uh, firstly, Stalin himself, and here you can say, see, excuse me, a, he, he signed one of the documents, such documents, such reports about the Holocaust to my archive, okay? And of course, Mr. Molotov, the head of ministry of Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, and a Mr. Vorov, Tavarish Voroshilov and Tavarish Beria, all of them knew for sure, okay? Of course, the uh, bosses uh, uh, of all the occupied, the communist bosses of all of occupied republics, and uh, I've already mentioned uh, Tavarish Panamarenka and of course Tavarish Khrushchev and all others, they knew they were getting this information constantly. They were very well informed by different intelligence services in the field about the extermination of the Jewish population. And here we are concluding, actually, gathering apparatus that dealt with the Holocaust exceeded the Soviet intelligence and security community official boundaries. As I said, not only the military intelligence and the NKVD, but also the partisans, also the different uh, communist undergrounds and even the political directorate of the Red Army, all of them were gathering information about the uh, situation, general situation in the occupied territories. And by doing this, they also reported about the fate of the Jewish population. The mass murder of Soviet Jews by the Nazis and their local supporters was constantly addressed in the Soviet intelligence reports. I'm stressing this from the very beginning until the very end of the war. They were reporting about the fate of the uh, poor Jews, of the uh, Jewish population exterminated and persecuted by, by the Nazis. Uh, the information about the Holocaust was collected by all the possible methods known to the Soviets by this time, including even the signal, the signal intelligence. The reports of the Holocaust cover the entire occupation period, as I already said, and almost the entire occupied territory. There was much less information about uh, uh, Moldavia, for example, which was almost unreachable for the Soviet uh, intelligence, or uh, in uh, late 1942, there was a very uh, a little information gathered a, a, a around Stalingrad, for example, taking into consideration a very complicated operational conditions in this a specific region. But speaking about the rest of the occupied territories, we can conclude that they covered those territories in their entirety, and they uh, frequently sent up to date information in the real time. Actually, many different key events were reported in real time or even, even a bit prior to the event, like the report about the uh, planned liquidation of the Vilnius ghetto uh, in September 1943. It was provided about a week prior to the extermination of the uh, local Jews or, or the ghetto it, it itself. Uh, and the most remarkable success of the Soviet intelligence in this field to my opinion, to my conclusion, it's, it's, it's clear understanding of the genocidal character of the Nazi anti-Jewish atrocity. As I already stressed, they understood already in about mid-1942, based on the reports of Sudmalis and other guys, they understood that actually the Nazis are trying to kill all the Jews, all the Jews in the territories in their hands until the last of them. 
And actually they didn't use the word genocide, but they uh, actually meant this. They knew that uh, all the Jews should be exterminated by the, by the Nazis. And I put here that this uh, amazing book, US Intelligence and the Nazis, and they were talking here, it is a nice collection of different uh, articles about the knowledge of the Holocaust possessed by different Western agencies uh, in real time. So it was published published already in the West, but we knew almost nothing about the knowledge about the, of the Soviets, of the Soviet intelligence uh, uh, in this field. And actually, thanks to this research, now we are capable of saying all these things that I already said here. Uh, and page down, so what? This question was answered by my uh, a very respected colleague, Professor Dino Parati in Yad Vashem a couple of years ago, after having heard all of these revelations, she asked me, so what? Okay, so they knew all these things and they did almost nothing. Yes, I completely agree with her statement and it was also already mentioned by my other colleagues like Robert Gelatelli and they, already claimed that in, uh, the, the, the Soviets published almost nothing about the fate of the Jews, but in my eyes, it makes difference. So now we know that this absence of disclosure of this, no, of this knowledge of the fate of the Jews in the Nazi occupied territories, it was based on a very good knowledge of the, of, of the phenomenon, okay? so. They decided not to tell a word, or almost not to tell a word, to the to their own Soviet population and to the outside world. Uh, and they knew for sure what exactly they are trying to hide from the local population and from the outside world. They knew exactly about the scope and patterns of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, firstly in the Soviet Union, but also in other European territories. And just a word about the future research. So I'm already thinking about probably two books, not one. The first one will be dedicated to the a period from uh, 1933 and until 1945, actually until the end of the Second World War. But there is also a great deal of information related to the post-war post -war period. And I just will say briefly that I already revealed, learned that the Soviets, the, the KGB, the main Soviet intelligence agency after the war was gathering information about the Nazi atrocities and, and about the local participators in these atrocities until the very end of the Soviet regime, until the downfall of the Soviet Union in 1991. And you can see here a cover, a cover page of a, a file of the KGB file, which is dedicated to one of the local sisters to the Germans. And he was persecuted, he was hunted and persecuted by the KGB in the late eighties, uh, just if, a very brief time before the downfall of the Soviet Union. And just recently, thanks to one of my uh, Polish colleagues, Professor Gastol, I got this very interesting information, this report sent by a Polish agent in Israel during uh, Eichmann's trial in Israel in 1961. So the Polish communist intelligence cooperating with the Soviet intelligence they were trying to get information about a, uh, the anti-Jewish atrocities in the uh, Nazi occupied Soviet and Polish territories. Uh, so the entire intelligence, communist intelligence apparatus in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, amazingly after the war, it was trying to gather this information for the local Soviet purposes, but political purposes for the purposes of the propaganda, but much more for the geopolitical purposes for establishing uh, the Soviet regime uh, as a superpower. And they were trying to, uh, to use this information to promote the image of the Soviet Union across the globe. Uh, 
that's it. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay, the time is now oh, half past eight. Okay, so I'm done and I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Professor Falikov, uh, for this extremely interesting, detailed, informative, and also passionately delivered presentation. I think we learned a great deal. I learned a great deal. And uh, I want to do something different. We have some questions that I will uh, um, later pose to you, but I want to pick up on this point uh, when you were speaking about the so what. And uh, of course, I don't think that is the response to your research, and I don't think that's the question. But if I could push you a little bit uh, further on the implications, my sense is that uh, rather than so what, the questions would probably be along the lines of, on the one hand, uh, how this knowledge at times superior to the knowledge of uh, the Western intelligence services, uh, especially, of course, with the Shoah in the occupied territories. How did this knowledge inform the policies, actions, and efforts, specifically at uh, rescuing more Jews? On the other hand, how did this superior knowledge uh, affect the general delivery of information, specific information, articulate information about the, uh, about the extermination of Jews, not Soviet civilians um, on Mark, but Jews in the occupied territories? Because, of course, on the latter front, uh, we have uh, remarkable examples of a complete disconnect uh, to take one uh, when Grossman is working on his report on Treblinka, he has to do basic calculations uh, about the number of people arriving. He also makes some extremely dramatic, uh, compelling errors like the killing agent. Why couldn't he have been advised by the intelligence service that of course had this knowledge? So to me, your research really pushes us to rethink these two directions. I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Okay, you are completely right. I completely agree with you. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, speaking about this specific event of Grossman, yeah, uh, there was no connection whatsoever between those guys in the field and the intelligence. These were completely two completely separated entities the ministry or the commissariat for the foreign affairs, he was advised sometimes by the intelligence, specifically during the preparation to uh, uh, the trials, to the Nuremberg trials in Germany after the war. I saw the correspondence between the MFA and the NKVD, and they were asking for the information. They wrote in the internal correspondence in the MFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, We've got some uh, very nice information for, from the Jewish anti-fascist committee, but we know that there is much broader information kept by the NKVD, so we have to try to get it from them. Okay, so you also, you, you, you do see that different bodies, different entities, different actors were trying to gather this information completely, completely uh, on a, how to say, without any connection with each other, okay? Uncoordinatedly, okay? So, uh, yeah. So uh, this is a very interesting question about the uh, entire uh, culture of doing things, okay? Uh, knowledge is power in Stalin's Russia and in Putin's Russia, okay? So they do not tend to share this information among them. They are keeping this information close to their body and they are using it for uh, uh, empowering themselves in the local hierarchy, okay? So to be closer to the leader, okay? To get more money, to get more power, get more influence. And in this specific case, I think the information about the fate of the Jews was one of such a, a pieces of information regarded very, um, very useful for achieving these goals. Thank you, Yakov. And I'm gonna ask you one more question. Then there are some very interesting questions that our colleagues have prepared, which is, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the way the intelligence 
information gathering about the Shoah interacted with the other branch of information gathering, which systematically begins in February 1942, namely the gathering under the specific auspices of the NKVD of information in the recently liberated territories. As you know, on the 25th of February, 1942, Beria specifically yeah. issues a detailed instruction on the strength of the evidence of the massive killings of Jews in Eastern Crimea. And he basically instructs the local organs to gather detailed reports. He doesn't specifically say about the extermination of Jews. It's coded, but nevertheless, these are the reports. So how does that information coalesce with what the intelligence sources were gathering? Okay, very nice question. Thank you very much, Professor Schreier. You are completely right. The NKVD and Smersh and in other intelligence and security bodies, they were deeply involved in this massive effort to gather the information in the newly liberated territories. Uh, the NKVD guys were usually attached to uh, the representatives of uh, the uh, highest commission for uh, investigating the, the German prize in the occupied territories. Yeah, and uh, as far as I understood, they were providing at least some information, at least some information to this commission, which was melted with other information uh, uh, obtained by other sources and channels, and then provided to the highest authorities in Moscow. But as I already said, there was also bulk of information kept by those services, by Smersh, by NKVD and other, by the political directorate of the Red Army, which was not provided to the, to the, to the commission, uh, which is interesting and, interesting, and I would like to stress this. When they are entering the newly liberated territories, for example, the NKVD, the Smersh and others, one of the first questions, and you can see it clearly in their reports, interrogation reports, one of the first questions they are asking the interrogates dedicated to the fate of the Jewish population. They knew that they are dealing with the extermination of the Jewish population, and they were asking during the war and also after the war, it, it was striking to reveal that in Abkhazia in 1947, the local, by this time, M MGB, MGB, Ministry for State uh, Security, they were hunting different Ukrainians and Belarusians and Russians who were trying to hide themselves, who, who cooperated with the Germans and fled these territories in Ukraine mm -hmm. and Belarus. And they were trying to hide themselves in Caucasus, in the Central Asia. And these guys, MGB guys, MGB guys, they were uh, um, arresting them and interrogating them. And they were asking them one of the first, the initial questions, tell us, us where you have been when the Germans exterminated the Jews. And one of the pol uh, former policemen, Ukrainian policemen, he tried to answer, I've never seen and heard, blah, 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 blah. and his interrogator uh, tells him, don't lie to me, we know for sure. But one of the first things done by the Germans when they entered the Soviet territories was to exterminate totally the local Jews. And by this time, you were already in the uh, Ukrainian police, and so you must have participated in these atrocities. So they knew in the very distant Abkhazia in 1947, after the war, they knew it was already the common knowledge of the entire organization, yeah. of the entire organization. The, uh, the tip of the iceberg was the very, very uh, limited information provided to the local, to the local population during a series of show trials, for example, in the Soviet Union, yeah? But, but under the uh, waterline, there was a big, huge system of the Communist Party, of the NKVD, of the legal authorities who knew for sure the entire picture the internal discourse, and it is amazing to see the difference between the disclosure to the general public and the internal knowledge, the system knowledge about the Holocaust. They knew, they knew everything. They wrote openly, no, no limitation. It is amazing, but only inside the system. 
Yeah, so Not in other words, yeah. Yeah, okay. if we were only to infer in the absence of stated policies, uh, if we were to infer what we know about the Soviet <coughs> practices uh, during the war and after the war, when it uh, comes to the Holocaust, the picture of what was going on in the uh, intelligence community is much rosier than the picture based on, say, party documents that we issued to the public. I think that's a very good observation. Thank you. Let me turn to some questions. Uh, we have two questions from our uh, colleague, Darius uh, Stola, whom I'm sure you know, uh, the former director of Polin and a very important historian, uh, my good friend. Uh, um, Darius has two questions. One, when was the first report that mentions a total slash indiscriminate killing of Jews in the summer of 1941. When was that report issued? And the second question, have you seen any reports about the deportations of the Warsaw Ghetto in July, September 1942? Meaning uh, reports in the Soviet th intelligence. Th thank you, uh, Professor Stola, for these uh, amazing questions. Uh, first, it was a second question. I haven't seen such a report, okay? But I haven't seen all the reports and I'm still trying to obtain as much as possible, but specifically about this subject, I saw nothing until today. About uh, 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 Answering the first question about the starting of the mass killing, as I said, it was already reported by Panamarenko in late uh, June, actually, uh, um, in, in the first week of the occupation of the invasion, and later on even more in July, August. And by September, October, we already have ki a kind of wave of reporting. They, already, they are starting to understand different guys who different agents and dispatchers, different uh, officers of the NKVD, RU and political department, they are entering these territories or otherwise they are coming back to the Soviet territory from the occupied territories and they are witnessing shockingly. So they were by themselves, they were shocked. The Nazis, they are targeting each and every Jew and they are exterminating all of them. And it is obvious from these reports that by this time, they already understood the character, the genocidal character of these events. So we are talking about uh, from the very beginning, but much more obviously about September, October of 1941, then this understanding natures already, okay? And they, they, they knew, they knew that the Nazis are hunting all the Jewish population. Right. Uh, we also had a couple of questions that I think you have partially uh, addressed. So I wonder, uh, we have a little bit of time left, so I wonder if we could use some of it to discuss perhaps uh, general issues of comparative typology of uh, Soviet intelligence gathering on the Shoah and how that was turned or not turned into action and those uh, by the British and American intelligence services. I think this makes for a very interesting comparison because in both cases, there is a lot of evidence, but uh, um, principal actions are forestalled or ruled out. So I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, so uh, here, to my opinion, we have to distinguish uh, between two different levels. The superiors in uh, Kiev and later on in Moscow and other places, uh, they were getting this information and even writing as we saw Stalin signed on one of the reports to my archive, but they were giving no orders to translate this information into the movements, into the deeds, concrete deeds in the field for saving these poor Jews, okay? Uh, on the other hand, in different places across the occupied territories, we do witness the local initiatives by the local communist, different local tactical communist authorities and partisan commanders to assist here in their different Jewish small communities, to help them to escape to the forests, 
to forewarn them about the forthcoming extermination of a specific ghetto. Yeah, such events were not multiple, but yes, we are witnessing them. We do possess a series of such testimonies. So I would separate between these two levels, the ground level, the tactical level, where the local initiatives were taken, and the strategic level, when these superior guys like Stalin and uh, like Molotov and others were sitting, they knew a lot, but they not necessarily wanted to save these Jews, yeah? But they knew how to instrumentalize this information later. As I said, during the series of the show trials inside the Soviet Union and also uh, during the Nuremberg trials. Very good. We have some more questions, if you don't mind, that have just uh, reached my feed. My pleasure. One comes from uh, our colleague, Mark Kramer, who I don't know if you know him, of course, is a great expert on the Cold War and also on Soviet archives. And he's asking how much of the intelligence was reaching Stalin, Molotov and other top political leaders? How quickly did it reach them? And I think the second question is particularly poignant. How quickly? Okay, so how much, thank you for this question, yeah, which is very relevant and uh, important. I, I do not really know how to, uh, uh, you know, how to count them, okay? I saw many reports, but definitely not thousands, okay? So, you know, much more were disseminated among the uh, tactical and uh, operational levels of the intelligence community, much less reached the superiors, but again, we can see that it was enough. All the key events in different places were known to those guys. They were reported. So here, what plays uh, plays uh, the crucial role is not the quantity but the quality. Okay, so they knew they knew about the key events, which was enough. And uh, the second question was about. Excuse me, just remind me. The second question was how quickly, in other words, not how just quickly. how much, but how quickly did it cross? How quickly. The desk? Okay, so uh, in some places, many actually places, there was some delay between the event and the learning, obtaining the information about the event, and afterwards also between the learning and the reporting to the superiors. Okay. Now, again, taking into consideration the very complicated operational environment in the occupied territories and the very uh, question of crossing the lines. You know, it was very hard. I, I, I already wrote in this book about the partisan intelligence that most of the information, uh, at least during the first year and probably year and a half of the occupation, most of the information was sent to the center by dispatchers. Mm. Okay. Uh, so it was, a, a, and most of them very young people, very young boys and girls, uh, teenagers, and even uh, kids who were sent to cross the lines, the front line, and to reach the Soviet authorities on the Soviet territory. So many of them perished by crossing these lines. Okay. So in many cases, in many cases, there was even very big delay between gathering the information and its reporting to the superiors, but. In a series of cases, we do learn about the capability of different intelligence services to report almost immediately, which is, which is very important. For yeah. example, the case of Babi Yar, it was initially reported just a few, um, a few weeks, let's say, a few weeks after the event. It took some weeks, which is understandable completely, but it was quite weak. Okay, and other uh, and other events, and in some cases, which were quite rare, but again, uh, they were. Okay, so in some cases, the information, like in the case of the Vilnius ghetto, was provided even prior to the event. Or in other case, I can recall now uh, about Mal the, the, the camp of Malitrostenets, for example, the the very existence of this place. And the description of the atrocities committed by the Nazis in this camp were provided to the Soviets during its existence and actually about a year before 
this uh, uh, before this place ceased to, 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 to act, okay? So it was intelligence provided in, the, in, in real time, which was very, and, and again, by the way, what the Soviets had done with this information, nothing. The information was obtained, reported, and nothing was done to, to stop the activity of this camp. Yeah, Ehrenberg would later write about this and actually include his own snapshot, uh, a very graphic snapshot of uh, the ground with uh, crushed skulls. Um, now, we have uh, a few more, if you don't mind, uh, very interesting questions. One from uh, our colleague, your colleague, Kirill Pfefferman, a great specialist in the Shoah, in the... Uh, Good evening, Arts. Kirill. Yes, so Kirill Ryan, he actually spoke in this seminar two years ago about the evacuation uh, of Soviet Jews into the hinterlands. So Kirill writes, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. What can you tell about the presence of Jews among NKVD handlers of intelligence networks dealing with Jews in the occupied areas? Put it otherwise, who asked about information on the Holocaust, Jewish or non-Jewish NKVD officers? And the second question, to what extent was this interest in Jewish matters among Soviet political leaders and security officials regarded as normal, not inflated, as contrasted, for example, with the interest in the fate of all other Soviet ethnicities? There's a lot okay. there, so maybe you could answer. You get could just go great. to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great questions. Uh, thank you again. I was already asked uh, about the Jewishness of those interrogators and handlers. Yeah. So some of them, for sure, we know from the names and surnames, they were Jews, and so uh, it is not surprisingly that, uh, that, that they were asking about probably about the fate of uh, their uh, fellow uh, uh, people. But 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 uh, many of them, first many. Jewish officers were hiding themselves under uh, the Slavic or Russian surnames. So we cannot tell for sure that all of them were Jewish origin. And uh, in, in many, many, many of those people, they signed with a completely Slavic or other names, Latvian, Estonian, whatever, okay? So not all of them, not all of the interrogators and handlers who were dealing with this specific question were of the Jewish origin. Many of them probably not. Okay. So I can't I can't tell something more general. Okay. I guess that some of them, as far as I understood, some of them were, were, were Jews, but others not. Okay. And I, about the normality of this subject, at some stage of uh, the intelligence process and all the interrogations, it looks, at least to me, that it became a kind of a normal question. They knew a lot about this phenomenon. They knew that this was one of the main patterns of the uh, behavior, of the o o occupier's behavior. And they knew that this could be a very strong point in, uh, in, in the post-war or even during the war of the accusations against the criminals themselves and also against their uh, sisters, okay? So yes, they were, it was a kind of pattern of interrogation pattern or list of the questions to be, to be asked during the interrogation. And one of them, one of the first questions actually was dedicated to the fate of the Jewish population. So yes, it became at some stage, it became a completely normal question to my opinion. Very good. Uh, if you don't mind, let's take two more questions. Uh, and I apologize to those colleagues with whose questions with we have not been able to address specifically, although I think we've addressed parts of them. So this one comes from our colleague, Julia Riegel, who is uh, a historian of the Warsaw Ghetto, who is actually here as a fellow at the Center for Jewish Studies at Harvard and whom I saw a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so Julia is asking, uh, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. I have a number of questions. First, there is a uh, broader agreement among most Holocaust scholars that the Nazi decision to murder the Jews of Europe en masse was made sometime in the months immediately after the invasion of the Soviet Union, most likely in the summer of 1941, though some disagree. Do any of the sources you've uncovered shed light on the debates about when the decision was made? No, unfortunately not. 
Uh, by this time, the Soviet intelligence had no sources whatsoever within uh, the uh, German authorities, which actually made such a decision. So by this time, uh, the entire network, or almost the entire network, which was active prior to the war, it, within the Third Reich was liquidated by the Germans. Mm. And in the occupied territories, they were able to obtain this information only from the field, but not to enter, not to penetrate the German occupying author authorities themselves. This proved to be a very hard task even later. They managed to penetrate some, some, uh, um, uh, uh, some local authorities of the Gestapo and uh, uh, the, uh, even the Wehrmacht here and there, but not to the places where such decisions were taken, unfortunately. So we, we do not possess such information. Thank you, Jakob. And I think it's fitting that we uh, conclude with this question from Jay Wilbur. What evidence is there of how this information was shared with U.S. and British allies, if at all? And is there any evidence of any shared discussion of what policy responses should be considered among the allies? And I suspect okay. this is not re referring to questions of post-war justice, because of course there are many, there's a lot of evidence of that. I think this is specific. But it was mostly yeah. about, about, about the post-war justice, okay? Some of this information uh, was shared with the Americans uh, by uh, uh, Mikhail, for example, in 1943. Uh, I guess that some of the information he, 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 he got to, to, to deliver to the Americans and to the British was uh, from these sources. But mostly the Soviets kept this information for themselves. I haven't seen any official sharing during the channels of intelligence, for example, with the Americans and the British. So no, the, uh, my, my answer is no. Most in the, of the information, unfortunately, wasn't shared and was kept, was kept in the Soviet Union until the end of the war. Yes, Yakov, uh, Professor Falkov, thank you so much. We look forward to your further investigations. This is fascinating work. Thanks for being with us and thank you all for being here. I hope to see some of you in November for Victoria Hitler's talk, which will be about the commemoration of the Babin Yar massacres. Thanks again. Have a great thank day. You for thank you. Today. Thank you very much. Good evening. Bye bye. See you all later.